Hey, good evening, and welcome to the special pandemic version of Montpelier Civic Forum. Why are we the pandemic version? That's kind of obvious. Uh, we have the pandemic town hall meeting this year, which basically means most of you will use your absentee ballots to vote. Some of you will actually get out there on the 2nd of March on Tuesday and actually vote. And we have an excellent slate of shows this year. Uh, again, Ann Watson has graced us with her time to do a state of Montpelier from the mayor's perspective, which is really good. And she walks us through all corners, talking about projects that are ongoing, talk about projects that might be pushed off, talking about projects that might be, you know, given the circumstances. Anne returns with Bill to do the city budget, and that was a really good show as well. Jim Murphy came in to talk about the school budget, and then we have our slate of candidates for school and for city, and those are really, really good candidates, and they were really good shows. And tonight, I have an incumbent council person with me. In fact, I have my council person from District 2, Jack McCullough. Richard, thanks for having me. We've been here before, and I look forward to it. How many times have we been? <laughs> Two, maybe, something like that. Right, this will make our third. I think this will be our third. Why did you want to get on council? You were an appointment at the time. What, what, what was going through your mind? I know you weren't thinking, I want to get rich. <laughs> Not a way to get rich. It's, uh, it certainly takes up a lot of time, but it's a really good way to make a contribution to the city and to have a voice in what we think the uh, future of the city is going to be. You know, I love Montpelier, and you've heard me say before that Montpelier is the best place in all of Vermont to live, and I really believe that. And uh, The best place in Vermont or the best place in New England or in the United States? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, it kind of depends on what you're looking for, but uh, I know enough about Vermont to know that I think it's the best place in Vermont. It's, there, aren't, there aren't many places other than Montpelier that I would want to live anywhere. Why? What, what is in Montpelier that isn't in Brattleboro or isn't in Burlington or Middlebury? It's a great community. It's a, it's a manageable size. It has a, a great people who are really involved in, in the life of their community. I sometimes think of uh, living in Montpelier as like living in the Shire. And <laughs> that's the first time I've heard it. Keep in, going on uh, that one. <clears throat> from uh, from The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, and and we're like in this warm Middle Earth type of uh, community setting where you uh, you know the people. You know, I I have back in my house. Uh, picture of uh, my older son's first day of kindergarten with his uh, classmates from kindergarten and those are the same kids that he was graduating from high school with 12 years later and uh, that aside from the fact that you get to see we have all the cultural advantages that you would never see in a city this size you know professional theater great bookstores the uh, Government, where you can go downtown and see the members of the city, of the uh, Supreme Court walking down the street to have lunch together, uh, run into our uh, senior senator doing his shopping downtown, um, and and we really do. I I think we owe a lot to the members of the community. From my role on the city council, I see. A lot of people, because we review and make appointments to city boards and commissions, and the people that apply and the people that are willing to serve are people with a tremendous degree of education and expertise in the areas that they're uh, looking to work on, and uh, and so we have. Uh, it's just a great community. I want to go back to the Shire again. I, I'd never heard that. A sh the Shire was a very homogenous community that they lived in. Your expertise that you brought to council, that still is with council, people turn to you on housing questions. Why? I spent, I spent a good part of my, uh, my legal career 
work, and even before I was working as a lawyer, working on housing issues back from when I was in, uh, in college at Michigan State in East Lansing. And uh, through my law school career and my early years of uh, practicing law at legal aid in two different states, I focused a lot on housing. And I was always gravitated to that because it's a vital area for people. What, what happens in your housing is, uh, is really, really going to affect your entire life. And of the clients that I've worked with, represented mostly people in evictions or people with uh, bad conditions in, uh, in rental property. It's the impact of living in substandard housing or even more of the possibility of losing your housing is just a tremendous impact on people. And so it's always been important to me to protect people's housing rights and to expand people's housing opportunities. Are you concerned, This I'm looping back to the Shire again, are you concerned from when you came to Montpelier and were working on housing with lower, an emphasis on the lower income, are you concerned that this is becoming more of a gated community and that basically uh, we're becoming more homogenous? When you spoke about the people who volunteer for the committees, those are skilled middle class people bringing their middle class expertise. Are you concerned that rising rents and the like and stagnant incomes are forcing this into much more of a homogenous community? It's housing availability is a real problem in Montpelier and uh, that that is a, a real concern of mine. People can't, cannot afford to uh, rent or buy houses in Montpelier. Ordinary people who, who want to live here or who have a need to live here because they have uh, service sector jobs have a hard time getting getting a place to rent there. We have not provided as, and produced as much housing as we really need, and we um, we need to do better in that. You know, when we've done a fair, we've, we've produced some, a reasonable amount of housing just in the last several years. You know, you're familiar with the, uh, with the Taylor Street project, you're familiar with the- uh, The one above Abishan. With the French block, and that is, that is a great, uh, great thing if you've ever been there or if you've not been there I can just tell you it's very nice housing it's a great location someone can live there and not uh, not need a car and it really was a boon to the community to take that property that was essentially abandoned derelict structure at least the upper floors and turned into beautiful uh, well-maintained affordable housing and we need to do more of that. Well, we did that years ago over by the bridge on Berry Street. Yes. What are those called? And then we did it with Fisher Auto, didn't we? We've done that, yep. And, um, and Elm Street, out on Elm Street, a long time ago. A long time ago, that's right. Uh, the Down Street Housing has uh, done a tremendous job in Montpelier. Still hasn't met all of the need. We still need... Uh, need more housing, and we need ho housing at uh, all price points. Even, you know, affordable housing, you know, people for, uh, housing for low-income people is very, very important. Uh, also, uh, more market rate housing is, uh, is also a value. I, I just saw a paper the other day that I haven't had a chance to read through in its entirety yet. The, uh, on the effects of on the effects of the whole rental market on development of uh, market rate housing, and the question is, well, if we if we have market rate housing developed, is that going to? Well, there are a couple of ways that it can go. One is it can is essentially drive up the prices of all the housing in the area because it brings uh, more affluent people in, or it can uh, provide an opportunity for people who could afford a bit more expensive housing to move there and free up some uh, lower-priced housing for, for people who need lower-priced housing. 
When we did our master plan a few years ago, you were on the council. Um, it, I think I was just, just, just before I got on the council. Oh, was it? Okay. Yeah, now, but I if, worked on it. Now, if I'm correct, and correct me if I'm, well, actually, I'll edit this out if I'm not. <laughs> uh, Jack, didn't that make it easier for people to subdivide their homes into multiplexes? Yes, the master plan and the, uh, and the zoning ordinance uh, have made it easier for people to do that. I don't think we've seen a lot of that. There's still work that needs to be done, but, but yes. One of the things that is happening right now is that we have uh, a pilot project happening in Montpelier. Unfortunately, it, it's started to get rolling right around the time that the pandemic started, but it's a pilot operated by uh, the Vermont State Housing Authority to provide grants for people to do accessory dwelling units. And uh, do we anticipate that that will create a significant amount or is this going to just be on the margin? Well, it's a, it's a pilot. So we're trying, the hope is to develop, to demonstrate that uh, it can have a, uh, a real impact on on housing availability and uh, the uptake level has been pretty good there's one of the things that I think we're seeing even though it's not completed but we are say, seeing that there is there is demand there are people who would do that if they uh, if they had the money to do that and if they had a sort of a a guide to see see their way from from where they are now to the completion of the project. Is the last remaining affordable housing south of the river, or, or somewhat affordable housing, as you define a, affordable housing, would it be south of the river in District Three, and the those houses that were built before and after World War II? I can't tell you where housing affordability is. I know that in, I don't know what's happened south of the river, but I know that uh, this past year the housing market has been probably pretty good if you're a seller, but uh, but very bad if you're a buyer. Um, and I that's know, before the appraisal? Oh. That's coming in two years? Yeah, it's it's just based on sales in, the, in this past year. I know that there are many houses in Montpelier that were going for Fifteen or twenty thousand dollars or more over the asking price, and going quicker, and going really fast. Yeah. Are we going to see now? You were not on console, but you've been in Montpelier longer than I have. Are we ever going to see housing on Sabin's pasture? Interesting that you ask that. We just had a discussion at the city council just this just two nights ago on on Wednesday night about some proposed changes to the zoning ordinance that uh, are designed to make it easier to develop uh, housing on, on Sabin's pasture. I think those were working in coordination with the Zorzi family, weren't they? Yes. Now, if I'm correct, and I always screw this up, so you can be the fifth council candidate to say I messed it up. Is it Gin Lane that leads out of the distillery? Yes. I believe the gin lane was positioned so that it could, in theory, go up that hill. I don't know how that property was developed, so I, I don't have... <laughs> but I do believe that, that there was forethought given as to where gin lane should be, and that ultimately it would be an intersection, in theory, that, that went up the hill, if there was anything up the hill to go to. Could be. As I say, I hate to say something that I don't authoritatively know about, but I do know that there, uh, there is a plan, or that plans are being considered to develop more housing on the, on the lower part of Sabin's pasture, the bottom 15 acres or so, I think. And um, we had a couple of changes that we're still being, still considering. There's going to be another public hearing on the ordinance on, at our next meeting on the 10th of March. And there are two major changes that we're talking about. And stop me if this is getting too, too much deep into in the detail. Weeds. Yeah, exactly. But one of the changes is to exempt that, uh, that part of the 
the city from having to develop that land as a planned unit development or PUD. And, and the other change what, has, what would the impact of that, that moratorium be? Or why was it suggested? There are some things that come with, uh, with PUD development that uh, really don't, don't make sense or might not make sense for, uh, for, for that area. For one thing, uh, developing a PUD enables you to get some uh, density bonuses. Density bonus means you can put more units on the property than you otherwise would be able to do. Based on the plans that they're talking about, they don't need the density bonuses to develop the number of units they're planning to. Uh, and that would simply aggravate the neighbors as well. If they, if they went to the number of units that the, that the proper, property is zoned for, sure. Uh, but I don't think they're planning on anywhere near that number of uh, units. What, were there numbers that were thrown out, rough numbers? Um, I think what we heard at last uh, on Wednesday was in the neighborhood of 50 or something like that. It wasn't wasn't a huge number of units. Um, and but but so one of the things is an, another thing is that in a PUD, all the structures are required to be facing the street. And for this property, it might make sense to have. Uh, the structures uh, go east west oriented to north, the south. oriented to the south right yeah you know, so that uh, they can take advantage of the uh, of the southern uh, southern exposure for the sun the the other uh, change has to do with uh, impact on uh, on surrounding intersections and removing the requirement that uh, any incremental reduction in the quality of an, inter, of an intersection would be um, a, an absolute bar to development. So mm -hmm. traffic is still considered, but as it's uh, being discussed in the proposed ordinance, it would not be an absolute bar because as you know... No, we're talking about hypothetical intersections. Well, we're talking about the actual intersection... With Barry? Of Barry Street oh, okay. and, uh, and Main Street, yeah. Because if there's more housing developed out there, it's gonna be putting more people onto uh, Barry Street and then to uh, Main Street. Was there any discussion, if we're going into Main Street from out of this hypothetical development, was there any discussion of the impact on Sibley? <laughs> well, of putting even more cars coming down Main Street or going up towards, uh, on Sibley towards college? That was not part of the discussion the other night. That's an interesting question. If, if yeah. Uh, in terms of, of Sabin's Pasture staying there, we did do some sewer work recently. So we at least we've started some infrastructure down there. Now this is a TIF region? I believe it is in the TIF district. Could you explain to people what a TIF is? I can try. <laughs> You could probably do a much better job than I. Um, the TIF stands for Tax Increment Financing. And uh, the basic concept is that uh, some of the in infrastructure uh, improvements that are needed to create the development, some of it are funded by taxes that come from the... Uh, the new development. That's a real, sh real quick but essentially accurate uh, way to say it. If a developer were chosen for savings, would it be a year, two years before we saw potentially 50 houses? It's hard to believe it would be that fast, but uh, you know, one of the things that people need to keep in mind is that zoning ordinances don't produce housing. Zoning ordinances create certain conditions which developers can then use to, uh, to develop the properties that they're going to develop. And so what actually happens, totally out of our hands. Once, once we've created, we've worked with the developers, the potential developers to produce the 
conditions that they're talking about needing for the development. And, and then there's a whole lot of other factors that control whether something happens. None of the people watching this, or you or I, have gone shopping downtown and parked in the parking garage. Is this subject to possible court challenge? Could this be tied up in years of court challenge? You mean this new ordinance? The, the that we're hypothetical about? 50 houses. Are, are the court challenges over on that property? Or it, is it possible that that would be tied up as well? I have. I, I would, wouldn't want to predict what, uh, what might happen. You know, any, any development, as we've seen in Montpelier, developments are regularly challenged at the development review board level. And, uh, but that doesn't mean that a properly designed uh, project that's a permitted use in that district shouldn't go forward. Well, I want to stay. I'm in, favor, an, I'm in favor of development. In theory, that would be our di district two, wouldn't it? Yeah, that's district two. Your district. Yeah. I, would those be all income housing, or is that or a possibility that those be very, very expensive? Of, let's start again. Would that be all levels of housing economically, or would that be a very expensive part of town? Not having talked to the uh, to the owners about what their plans are, I really can't answer that question. Did council consider mixed income housing in terms of zoning? What we're talking about is the number of units, the uh, the use of the space, um, the. Uh, the people who are living there is not part of the conversation we've been having for, for this zoning ordinance amendment. Is there any other section of town where you can see we have virgin land to actually build new houses? It's, uh, I, I think there is, you know, I, I know. And, you know, I, I hate to get into this kind of conversation because it might make people think, well, the city government is sitting around talking about uh, what, what they're going to tell this person or that person to do with their property. And we obviously can't do that. But I, I know that uh, there was a time where over in the uh, western uh, end of town, Alan Goldman had right, a right bunch of... Off uh, of Terrace. Yeah, had a bunch of uh, right. permits for housing development and... Uh, and turn them back, and but I don't think there's anything that could prevent that property from being developed. Um, there is there is some uh, some land over on the um, on the south side, like off uh, off Sherwood Drive in that area that. Uh, could still be developed. Is that the land that other people are talking about for, as a park? Off of Sherwood, behind Sherwood? Um, there's all kinds of things that people have talked about doing <laughs> over there. This is Montpelier. It is, yeah. Jack, I want to go on the flip side. I want to stay in housing. And what happens when the eviction moratorium ends? What's your thought on this? Because if anyone on council has given some serious thought to it, you have, and I know the rest of council has turned to you. What happens two months later in our town? Well, it, uh, it depends on a lot of things. I'm not doing housing uh, representation at, uh, at my day job anymore, but I know that at, at Legal Aid, where I work, we've been uh, very aggressive at trying to uh, defend against evictions, come up with uh, plans to uh, prevent evictions. Um, a few years ago, we did a study that showed that uh, if the state would just put a little bit of money into uh, essentially rent relief at the point of eviction, we could prevent 
almost all the evictions we have. You know, a couple of thousand dollars is enough to keep somebody in housing. And that seems like a pretty good deal to me. But wouldn't that be du during a normal period? I yeah. mean, during the pandemic right now, a couple of thousand is two months for people who haven't been able to pay their rent for months and months. Where do those people go if you're evicted? Someone who's, this is why, one of the reasons that I've always found uh, housing to be such an important area to work on, because uh, it's, a, it's a terrible uh, catastrophe for someone to, to be evicted. And, uh, and that's always been the case, and it, prob it always will be the case. So we've got the way the moratorium is working. It's, it's, it has not just required landlords to eat these terrible losses, because of course they can't do that either. Um, but we still need, of course, as I've been saying, more housing. <laughs> and uh, probably something else you're gonna get to, we need, to uh, we need more housing resources for people who don't have housing at all anymore. We're talking about the homeless. Yeah. What does our homeless task force do? We've had that in place for a while. We've had that in place for a while and they've been uh, working a lot at uh, understanding the issue, at uh, developing and supporting services for uh, people without housing. We, uh, we have uh, allocated money which is uh, to provide, uh, uh, to hire a, a, a service person to work with uh, homeless people, and this is uh, hopefully try to keep people, rescue people from the condition of being homeless. Um, we also have closely. a social worker, don't we? We also have a social worker who's working with the uh, Barry and Montpelier police departments. But yes, it's uh, it's it's been a rough winter for people. I can think back to, it was either New Year's Eve or New Year's Eve day. I spent probably six hours on the phone with, uh, with Ken Russell from- uh, The Homeless Task and, Force. Yeah, and uh, a variety of people to try to pull something together to keep this guy from not being stuck outside overnight and we were able to do it and th they were able to uh, arrange a place for him so he would not be stuck outside overnight. Um, it's, it's a real challenge. Is that the city's responsibility or the state's responsibility? Or does it fall between the cracks of the city and the state? Well, I've, I've been thinking about that a lot because uh, it's a problem. You look at the problem and you think, well, it has to be somebody's job to do something about it. Um, where I think where I think I come down is that the city of Montpelier d really doesn't have the resources to provide housing for everybody who needs housing. The uh, state of Vermont has really shown in the past year that uh, that we can. We can do a lot. We can start thinking about housing and homelessness differently from the way we've looked at it for years. Congregate shelters where people are st all staying in one place and then at night and then kicked out during the day. We've shown with the uh, resources that have been gone in, that have been put into uh, uh, hotel space that we don't have to have those big group shelters that provide not much more than a warm place to sleep at night. But at the same time, we had surplus hotel space. In theory, when we get rolling back into normalcy, we lose our surplus hotel space. Potentially. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I, uh, I mean, in theory, it would go towards use of, of people coming into the state, it, its original use, wouldn't it? Well, it might. I think that there, there are hotels and there are hotels. I don't know how uh, some of those hotel rooms or motel rooms are in places that probably don't cater to a lot of uh, interstate tourists. But isn't, I think you're pointing to a regional problem, aren't you? you know? Oh, it's a statewide problem, yeah. To where 
Barry doing its own thing and Montpelier doing its own thing, a lot of the client population is fungible and moves back and forth between those. And yeah, it, and we're recognizing that. You know, that's partly why it, it's made sense, for instance, to have Montpelier and Barry share a social worker but, in the, but between the police departments. Whether that's enough, I think that's an open question. Maybe in better financial times, we would look at uh, making the uh, social worker in uh, Montpelier police full time, not not necessarily sharing. But I don't I don't know that, that at this point. This but yeah, it's a it's a re it's a regional issue. The fact that the Good Samaritan Haven, for instance, pr uh, provides services in both Barry and Montpelier is an example of that. Um, and I think that we're not going back to not having regional co cooperation once the uh, uh, pandemic is, uh, is over. The schools right now are rethinking the school resource officer. And they defunded it, and the school resource officer went back to the city, and she's our 16th full police officer. They're rethinking the role of the police vis-a-vis -vis the schools. Are we rethinking the role of the police vis-a-vis -vis people who travel around the country and end up in our town with signs saying hungry and the like? Are we rethinking how the police interact and relate to those people? Is that a policing issue? <laughs> Is We've, well, we have done that in uh, a number of ways already. What have we done? Um, for, for one thing, you, I don't know if you recall this, but uh, a couple of years ago, the ACLU wrote to the uh, city council and said, you know, you've got this ordinance on your books that says panhandling is illegal and people could be arrested for panhandling. And, and other states that have had laws like that, the laws have been held unconstitutional. And we got that. Uh, communication, I immediately uh, proposed that we repeal that ordinance. It was unanimously accepted by the uh, council to repeal that ordinance. We're not locking people up for panhandling. What do we um, do with aggressive panhandling of our children? That's something I think we have a community consensus on, that we don't want our children aggressively panhandled. Is there anything that the community can do to end that? Well, um, I mean, I understand when you say that, that that's free speech for someone to approach my wife or myself, but to be approaching elementary school children, is, is there any way that that can be curbed? Or is that free speech? I would look at it a different way and think that we shouldn't be in a position we, we their society shouldn't have people shouldn't be set up so that people don't have a place to live and don't have enough money to support themselves so they have to be begging on the street from children but in the meantime before we reach that societal goal uh, is that something that the city of Montpelier can do nothing about no it's not something we can do nothing about we have the uh, we've got the homelessness, uh, I don't know if she's a social worker, but we've got service for, through the homelessness uh, task force. We have a social worker uh, with the police and, uh, and those are the kinds of things that are, it's probably more effective to have a social response to that kind of activity than, than, a, a, criminal than a criminal response to that kind of activity. When we go into homelessness and we go into the lawsuits around the country, there's been various kinds of disputes decided different ways on homeless people sleeping in the parks. Uh, do you anticipate that we'll have that conflict over Hubbard Park, which is closed at dusk and has always been closed at dusk, that indeed we might get a lawsuit that would have homeless people sleeping in Hubbard Park? I don't anticipate that, but I don't know what's going to happen. You know, I, I, I don't like to speculate about what might happen, because I, I, and I really don't think it will happen, but okay. it's pure speculation. Okay. Is, is that desirable? 
Uh, and one side, it does give clustered housing to people who need clustered housing for their own safety, if nothing else. On the other side, that's the crown jewel of our community. Yeah, I don't think it's desirable because I don't think it's desirable as a society to have people sleeping outside in the cold because they have no place else to go. Those people who are homeless, along with the rest of us, have access to free mass transit in our community. Do you have that on your phone? Yeah. Um, do, you, uh, do you know anything about it? What, what are we talking about? Explain it to people. So we, we have a new system called MyRide, and it, right now it's replacing the, uh, Circulate. the circulator, which uh, much of the day would drive around with no passengers. And the idea of MyRide is that you can use your app on your smartphone, or you can call, and you can say, I need a ride from here to the food co-op, or I need a ride up to the hospital. And it comes, picks you up, and delivers where you need to go. Sure sounds like Uber to me. Well, a free Uber. <laughs> I think part of the difference is, and I unfortunately I haven't ridden it uh, myself yet. I, I keep planning on doing that. but. Uh, the, uh, the idea is that you know it, it's still a bus. It's still a way of having more than one person uh, riding at a time. And I think it's another way that uh, people have thought about how to not have so many cars downtown, so many cars parked downtown, and to enable people to live a reasonable life in Montpelier even if they don't want to have a car. The model when that thing was, was granted assumed a number of people working downtown. Uh, do you think, and up on the hill, you know, in the National Life Complex, do you anticipate a return on, of working in actual workplaces, or do you think that, that people will be working at home for the foreseeable future? Oh, that's a real, uh, real question that we would love to know the answer to. Obviously, it... Uh, it was a hit to the businesses downtown when the uh, when the state workers were sent home to work uh, work out of their houses, and nobody knows, or at least nobody in city government that I'm aware of knows what the plan is going to be, how many people are going to be moved back into the offices, and when that's going to happen. I know I'm working out of my home. I've been. Uh, I've been to my office for, for visits a few times since, uh, since last March, but I'm work, working in my house. I'm actually doing, uh, doing trials in court from, uh, from a table in my, uh, in my family room. But we really, I, I would think that we'll be much better off if we can have people have workers working downtown in their in their offices. You know the the density, the contact uh, that people have with each other, uh, the social interaction and the commercial interaction are all a great benefit to the city. Now you also zoom council meetings now. Yeah. In terms of citizen participation, what is the difference in your mind between the type of person who's zooming in? and the type of person who would get up before the microphone? Is it, it, are they the same people who are responding to city council with questions in the old days were used to go up before the microphone and talk to you? I think it's a lot of the same people. I think that uh, we've, we've had some meetings where we've had 30 or 40 people logged in on Zoom and either listening or or speaking some some nights we don't have that many which is very much like in-person city council meetings sometimes there aren't that many many people there I would like to be able to get back to in-person meetings uh, when we can um, I think that uh, there's the quality of the interaction is is different and better when we're in person but we're certainly not uh, not close to that yet 
um, when we do go back in person, I would be, I would imagine, and I would be in favor of retaining Zoom as a way for people to participate uh, without coming in in person if that's what they choose. One of those 30 to 40 person meetings, or a couple of them, would have been over defunding the police. Yes. What's your take on that? As a city council person, when you hear defunding the police, how do you react? What, what's your thought? I mean, you've heard, you've heard extensively on this from other council people, from Bill and from Chief Pete and from the citizens. What, what's your take on that discussion? I think that uh, public safety and law enforcement are uh, a core public service. There's a, they're a core function of local government and we need to maintain that, uh, that level of, uh, of activity. You know, I don't think Montpelier is overly over-policed in any way. I think we've got a pretty, pretty bare bones police department and we, uh, we are able at our current level of, uh, of police to have, uh, have coverage 24 hours a day. If there were a significant uh, reduction in force, that uh, that might not be the case, and I think people would uh, would not be well served if if that were to happen. Now that said, are there things that we have police do that um, maybe someone else could do better? That's certainly one of the things we're exploring. Jack, I want to thank you so very much for being with us tonight. I love talking to incumbents because we can go into depth on things like housing, and you don't, you don't normally hear that. Even in a council meeting, you don't hear that kind of depth. And again, I would urge people to watch the show where Ann talks about the different projects in the town because it's a really good show. Watch the two budgets with Ann and Bill and with Jim Murphy because those are good shows where they really dig into the assumptions that underlie those budgets. And each of these shows with council candidates dwells on a different focus, on, on where their passion lies. Same with the school board candidates. They're all worth watching. They're all on ORCA, either on the Access Cable or ORCA, the YouTube channel. And most important, I'd urge you to get out and vote. Send in those absentee ballots. And if you can't send it in, go out and vote on Tuesday. And you won't find many people. The crowds, the lines won't be obscenely long. But do make sure during this era that we do have a healthy turnout for our town meeting day. Thank you so very much.